If you would like to earn CPE credit for listening to the show, visit earmarkcpe.com backslash FPA. Download the app, take a short quiz, and get your CPE certificate. If you would like to earn continuing education credit for your FP&A certification from the Association of Finance Professionals for listening to the show, go to the show notes for details on how to earn the credit. Finally, if you enjoy listening to FP&A today, please go to your podcast platform of choice, click the subscribe button, and leave a rating and review of the show. And now, on to the show. From Data Rails, this is FP&A Today. Hello, everyone. Welcome to FP&A Today. I am your host, Paul Barnhurst, aka the FP&A Guy, and you are listening to FP&A Today. FP&A Today is brought to you by DataRails, financial planning and analysis platform for Excel users. Every week, we welcome a leader from the world of financial planning and analysis, discuss some of the biggest stories and challenges in the world of FP&A. We will provide you with actionable advice about financial planning and analysis. This is going to be your go-to resource for everything FP&A. I'm thrilled to welcome today's guest on the show. We have with us Tom Hood. Tom, thanks for joining us. It's great to be here, Paul. Looking forward to this. Yeah, I really appreciate you carving out some time to us. So let me give a little bit of an introduction for Tom, and I'll give him an opportunity to tell us a little bit more about himself. So he comes to us from Baltimore, Maryland. He's the executive vice president for business engagement and growth at the Association of International Certified Professional Accountants. He's also a, an influencer, and he was given the prestigious de designation of top voice on LinkedIn. He has over 7,000 followers. He's also been ranked as one of the top 100 most influential people in accounting more than 15 times, and he's been number two on that list since 2011. So, Tom, why don't I give you the opportunity to just tell a little bit more about yourself and your background? All right, Paul. So I have to start by saying uh, I'm kind of like a, uh, a blind squirrel. Even a blind squirrel can find a nut sometimes. I've been honored to, to get some of those uh, accolades. And uh, just a slight correction, my LinkedIn followers are 700,000. Um, so Thank I've got you. that global. But that's because I was an original top 100 link, LinkedIn influencer. And um, you know, the rest is history, as they say. I, I got in early in social media, and that's been a, a real blessing for me. Um, my background is I am a um, accounting major, graduated from Loyola College, went to uh, get my CPA, which I did, and then moved into corporate. Uh, I've been in corporate finance effectively most of my career. I would argue I'm still in it today as an association executive. Um, about 12 or 13 years into my role as a CFO, uh, our company got acquired, basically a hostile acquisition by a big aggregate producer. And I didn't really want to go with that company. And at that stage, I had been active in the Maryland Association of CPAs and uh, was the prior chairman of the board, et cetera. And the new, the uh, executive director was retiring and they went for uh, a national search. I'm like, this would be a fun job for me because I'm passionate about the profession and, uh, and had all that experience in, um, at that time, highway construction. So that's what led me to the MACPA last 23 years. Uh, and then two years ago, Barry Melanson of the AICPA came to me and said, I want to see if you'd like a global stage because you're doing some great stuff there in Maryland and beyond. And, uh, and so I said, I'm interested. And that's, that led me to this role with the AICPA. We also had formed our Business Learning Institute, which the AICPA acquired, and that's now part of the AICPA. That's our um, learning and talent development mm -hmm. um, subsidiary. And so that's integrated into the AICPA at this stage. So that's how I got here. Great. And I appreciate the background. And it sounds like quite the exciting journey. Definitely a lot of accounting in there, that CFO, and a lot of great experience along the way for sure. So, you know, talking about that, can you tell our audience a little bit about the AICPA, like maybe how many members, how it came about, what its purpose is, some of those type of things? Yeah, absolutely. So many people think about CPA, Certified Public Accountant, and immediately think about the AICPA and all of the state CPA societies that are in, in, in the U.S. market. And while the, the CPA is being offered overseas, 
the license itself is a unique um, U.S. market attribute. Now, often people think of CPA and they think of public account, but about, I'm going to say 40% of our members are like I was, a CFO, controller in corporate accounting and finance, nonprofits, or government, right? So that's, that's the first part of that. Uh, about six years ago, we merged with SEMA, mm-hmm. the Chartered Institute of Management Accountants, which headquartered in the UK, but they were operating in about uh, you know, 180 countries. And that um, led us to really recognizing the folks in corporate finance in the AICPA segment as well. So we wanted to merge so we could bring that re- those resources to our U.S. CPAs and, and expand in the Americas where SEMA didn't have a big footprint. So that's the Chartered Global Management Accounting Credential CGMA. So together, it's the AICPA ampersand SEMA. Mm-hmm. And we offer the CPA and the CGMA. And right now we have about 700,000 members in 192 countries. Wow. So definitely a lot of people, big, big organization for sure. And so I appreciate giving a little bit of background and how the merger, you know, AICPA and CIMA So what are some of the programs you guys offer? I mean, obviously there's the CPA and the CMA, but you talk about the learning. And so maybe just talk about the resources that are available for people with that organization. Yeah. I mean, the, the, so I'm going to focus on the corporate finance market, which is my, my area, if you will. Um, So the CGMA, the Chartered Global Management Accounting has a finance leadership program that leads to that credential. It's a robust set of learning um, over like three levels that you can go to get that credential. So that's certainly one of the big resources, obviously one of the uh, objectives we're working towards. But um, we also created a, uh, a future of finance initiative. So one of the first things I did in my new role was started reaching out to our members in the U.S. market and asking them what the top issues were, what they were um, thinking about and struggling with, and it's funny because after about three or four calls, um, they were all facing the exact same things. <laughs> and after this is this is two years ago, by the way, that we actually started all of this. And so then we started to say, OK, if that's true, would you be interested in getting together to help us redefine and reimagine what the future of finance might look like? And pretty much one by one, they all said yes. Um, to our surprise, and uh, and so we formed this group, and we now have about fifty um, large corporate CFOs, CAOs, um, controllers that get together from mostly Fortune five hundred companies, and uh, and then into the middle market though, and we uh, we get together every other month, and we literally facilitate a roundtable about. What can what's the future finance look like? What can, how can we take it to the next level, and and what's happening there? And we've held two in person summits. Uh, the first year was in December in Nashville, last year in uh, Austin, and this year will be in Orlando. But that then we got together closer to a hundred people in heavy duty roundtables, just sharing what's going on and how we can help them be better senior finance leaders. So, um, so interesting enough, one, uh, I'm going to go a quick sidebar that relates to you and I talking. Um, our, one of our first members was a um, CFO of Walmart mm-hmm. who has since gotten promoted to a much bigger role. So we, we lost him on our group. He was there for about three months. He said an interesting thing. He said, Tom, I think as I'm looking at what's happening in my finance group here at Walmart, I'm seeing this idea of the great join." the join between accounting and finance. We need accounting to make sure the numbers are right and to keep up with our stewardship and trust notion. Um, But we need the financial viewpoint to deal, of course, through the pandemic, that showed up big time. And I think that's why we're getting this group together, Paul, is because it is needed to reimagine what's next. Mm -hmm. Because uh, McKinsey, I think, called this the next normal coming out of the pandemic. And that next normal implies more than one, right? Next, and then next, and then next. So I think we're now redefining the first next, which is the next couple of years, 
But I'm sure now that we have chat GPT on the scene, we're probably going to see another <laughs> next normal. And I, I and so have that's no how doubt. our group is looking at it. Yeah. Tom. Yeah. I, I love that. I love the kind of the idea of the next normal. I really like what you said. The person at Walmart, you know, accounting and finance, that merging, if they're not working together, there's a huge issue. You know, my career has been in fp and I don't have a CPA. Yes. Have I taken plenty of accounting courses? Yes. Cause I've done a finance and an MBA and a business and all those type of things. And I feel like I know it fairly well, but you know, I, I heavily rely on the accountant. As I like to say, fp best friend is a good accountant. Yeah, because without them, you're gonna you're gonna struggle. So I, I'm glad that you're you're covering both of those because there's so much between the two of them, and we'll yes. we'll talk a little bit more about that here in a few minutes. But question for you have is it's clear you have a you know just a passion for the accounting profession and moving it forward. Where does that come from? How did you develop such a passion for this field? So uh, in my in my role as uh, CFO, I mean, I guess I, I started out as a junior accountant. I mean, I went to night school and worked during the day. That was the that was the first part. I went to Loyola University, and then they had a nice um, night school program. So got my accounting degree in four years, working full time during the day, and uh, you know, it's about a good career. And I remember my first. Um, well, first real job. So after I graduated, then I went to an architecture firm and the CFO there who was a CPA was helped support me to get my CPA. And then he said, I'm going to make you write a check out of your own money to join the AICPA. And at that time, the Maryland Association of CPAs. Mm-hmm. And then he took me to my first meeting. <laughs> and I think that's the rest of the history because that first meeting, um, they started asking for people to join these committees. And I'm sitting there, you know, relatively new in the you know, accounting and finance world, trying to find my way. And joining a committee was a great way to start getting active in this profession and trying to figure out what was going on. So um, that led to a couple of things, other volunteer roles. But soon I was the chairman of the EDWP committee. Now, this will date me, Paul, but <laughs> you have any idea what that might be? E D W P. You know, I'm going to have to plead the fit that I have no idea on this one. <laughs> Something that I, so it was this, this really dates me the electronic data and word processing committee. Because at that time, this new thing called VisiCalc <laughs> yes. came out. That's, that's how long ago. And it ran on word. There weren't even PCs at that time. Yeah. So it ran on Wang word processors and other IBM word. Pro- it ran on the word processing area. And the first thing we were doing in this, in the architecture firm was, was having to do these big spreadsheets on percent complete for these large architectural projects, big shopping mm-hmm. malls and, and office buildings and things like that. So, you know, these massive amounts of data. And I was just lazy. I'm like, if I can find a better way to do this, I'm going to because it's painful putting in all the, you know, cross-footing those big calmer pads and all that. So VisiCalc was a game changer. And uh, and the association with other folks teaching us each other, right, a community to talk about getting better in finance and accounting. And sure enough, that's what that's what fueled my passion, that, um, that ultimately I would even join the Maryland Association as their CEO, which is what drove that. Yeah, sounds like you had a great boss that uh... – introduced you to something that you probably wouldn't have done on your own and sounds like it's changed your life. That's absolutely true. That's great. And I love the VisiCalc. You know, for me, I remember you know, high school getting our first computer. I was in high school in the 90s. You know, I Lotus Notes 1, 2, 3. And I still remember the little uh, piece of paper that would sit on the top of your keyboard and have all the shortcuts. Yep. <laughs> you know, you'd be looking going, okay, I need to do this. And, you know, the old monochrome or four color monitors, RGB. Yeah. And I, yeah, I think how far we've come today and I'm just like, people don't have an appreciation and you have it even more than I do, obviously, you know, having more of a work experience, but just what it was like before the internet and computers. Cause you know, the yes. internet, I was in high school, probably kind of college when the internet really kind of started late, you know, late nineties yeah. there. And <laughs> now it's like the internet goes down for five minutes. Like, what do we do? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's true. That is true. Now, I got to tell you one funny story about that, Paul. They, uh, so back in the day when um, when Excel really came into the, when you had PCs in the market, yep. you know, the IBM PC, which is a big, big mm-hmm. thing, 
Uh, yep. Obviously, the Mac was around, but but for business, it was the IBM PC. Yep. Two floppy disks, right? That whole deal. Yep. Um, at that time, there was an article in the Wall Street Journal that said Excel is going to be the end of accountants. Does that sound like a familiar theme we're hearing right now with chat GPT, right? Every time yeah, there's a major yep. innovation in software relative to accounting, it's the end of our profession. They're going to be, they're going to automate all of us into oblivion. Now, it was seriously funny because the, the subsequently the accountants blew up because now that you could do so much more analysis that the demand for accounting actually went off the charts. Um, now I understand chat GPT, different animal. But I would argue the thing that was game changer for me as a CFO was I could finally get things done. And I mean, it took us three weeks to close the books back then, God's sake, right? <laughs> and the CEO's coming in, we have a, we'd have a recession, and he's going, Tom, what's going on next, you know, next month? I'm like, I can't even finish this month. How do I know what's going to happen next month? Right? I can't get a base, baseline to, to uh, forecast off of. So you know, as an fp a guy, you get that, right? So yes. you know, now we're talking about closing in days or even a day. Mm-hmm. Um, Gartner, just a couple of weeks ago, was talking about uh, a, an automatic close by 2025. Yep, I've heard of the continuous close, which is you know another way of something kind of the automatic and some of those type of things. And I definitely think, especially for straightforward companies, we'll get there. You know, yeah. Some of the more complex, you might not quite get there, but even... I can't imagine, you know, being able to close on day two. Right. I think the best that was like, you know, day five, day six, right in that range. And, you know, my, one of the companies we might have kind of occasionally got day four. Yeah. You know, but that that was kind of pretty standard. And so even speeding that up to just have it on day one, even if you're not a continuous close, is a game changer compared to where we were with you, right? Three weeks that you're like, okay, honest CSO, CEO, I want to give you the answers but I don't even know what our numbers were last month. So it's hard for me to right. tell you. I couldn't yet. trust the accuracy, right? I didn't know we weren't all tied out and closed and that was risk. So I didn't want to end up giving them a bad number and putting the company at risk because we didn't know what the numbers truly were. Yeah, no, it's we definitely. And I, and I think you make a good point. We'll talk about that here in a minute on the chat GPT. And, you know, I always think of for what, for 15 years there, we always heard the next application was going to kill Excel. Right, right, the killer right. application. <laughs> you know, we have what a seven hundred. I've heard numbers anywhere from seven hundred and fifty million to a billion people using it. If that's if that's the software that's been killed, I want to develop that software. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so. You know what it is like: thirteen different spreadsheets emailed out to twenty-three different budget holders, multiple iterations, version control, errors back and forth updates. You never really feel in control of the consolidation and collection process. Yep, I've been there. Stop, breathe. DataRails is the financial planning and analysis platform for Excel users. DataRails takes data from all your company's disparate sources. No organization is too complex consolidating everything into one place, secured in the cloud. Now all your data finally talking to each other. Everything is automated back into your report in Excel. Cash flow, FX conversion, intercompany transactions, now automated and up to date. Drill down and variance analysis in seconds. Don't replace Excel, embrace Excel. Turn your Excel into a lean, mean FPNA machine. Find out more at www.datarails.com. You know, obviously you have the past. What's your favorite thing about the accounting profession? What do you love about it? What draws you to it? So I think when, when I, I mean, I, had no, I, I was a son of a Baltimore City police officer. So I had no first generation college in our family. So I had no idea what an accountant was or a CPA or any of that stuff. Um, thank God for college when I got to Loyola at night. Sure. Um, and that's, that was how I afforded it, right? They, they led us to that CPA and what, what could happen. And I think that the thing that was exciting is being the, I mean, accounting is a language of business. So you're learning a language that many people, dare I say most people, don't truly understand. And so you're, you become the value interpreter 
of everything about a business. And in, in the corporate world, I never did public accounting. And I know public accounting has similar attributes. And certainly the audit is a critical public interest function. Mm-hmm. Um, but the ability to learn a business and then understand it deeply from a financial aspect and use that to help create the business in a sustainable way. And our purpose now says to power trust, opportunity, and prosperity. And I feel like that, even though I didn't maybe wouldn't have said it that way back in the day, mm-hmm. that's what I learned is that the CEO, the bankers, the insurance people all relied on the numbers that I provided and telling that story about our highway construction company in that instance, right? And then other companies along the way, architecture, um, book publishing, some of the other jobs that I had. So that that's what was exciting about it. You have to understand the business to be able to tell that story. And and the biggest thing, which is why I was passionate about technology, is the technology was the enabler of getting to those numbers faster. That's why I loved Excel in the day, and that's why I love ChatGPT, and that's why I love cloud and a lot of these other technologies that we all rely on today, because they enable us to get to the story a lot faster and understanding whether it's right or not. Couldn't agree more. They really make it much, it's getting much easier to understand the data and to do things quicker. And we'll continue to see that. Yeah. You know, the advancements we're making right now sometimes are mind blowing how quick things are going as we watch it all. But one thing you said that I really liked is, you know, about empowering trust or building trust because we've all seen it been broken. You know, we think of the Enrons, the MCIs, the whole Arthur scandal. And so I really appreciate you saying that because. I know I've seen those situations where somebody's like, well, can't you do this? Or, well, can you book that number? And you're like, you know, I'd rather stay out of jail, but thanks for asking, you know, (laughs) type of thing. And so, you know, what are you guys doing just kind of in your organization? How, how do you focus on empowering that trust and making sure people can rely on those numbers? Cause it's just, it's a bedrock of the stock market and society that you have accurate numbers. Correct. That's right. And, th- and a lot of people don't understand that. It's the foundation of the whole capital market structure, right? Whether it's small business in Main Street or global Fortune 100s, right? They're all, mm-hmm. rel- people are relying on those numbers to loan money if it's your local bank or provide insurance. If it's, right, all those pieces rely on good, solid financial numbers, just not unlike a family and getting a mortgage, right? You got to give mm-hmm. them your, financial information. And if that's inaccurate, you've got a problem that we've had before also. So I think, but what what our role is, that's why we also merged with SEMA was to create the, you know, the world's largest kind of body of accounts. So we have a seat at the table globally to push and power that trust, opportunity, and prosperity. Because we think if the numbers are accurate and the CPAs and the CGMAs make them trustworthy, then the businesses will make the right decisions and they won't do bad things. Um, and that obviously that's not, you can't guarantee that, but it's certainly sure. more likely. And we focus on ethics as part of the whole credentialing process. And then we do ethics enforcement for both corporate or management accounts as well as CPAs. Um, in addition to the law, so the state boards of accountancy and the SEC, but we actually enforce ethics ourselves so if you had an unethical situation with a, a member, CGMA or CPA, you would report that, we would investigate it, and it could mean sanctioning or kicking that member out or even referring them to a, to a state uh, state board of accountancy or a, a regu- regulator for further investigation. So it's that, it's that much in our DNA to protect that notion. And that's why we'd like to, to continue growing and expanding that influence. So we think if we have a seat at the table, people will understand who we are and what we're doing, and that will drive more people to get those designations. And we have people reporting with self-study, making sure they're taking continuing professional development. All those pieces are helping to keep this profession, you know, rock solid from a trust perspective. Got it. And that that's great that you're doing that. I really like that you have, you know, the ethics standards. I think it's very important to organizations. It's critical. Like you said, it's that bedrock of foundation that we can trust the numbers. Our capital markets depend on it. It, ha- it has to be there. So, you know, we've talked a little bit about technology and I want to go, go there a little bit. So, you know, how are you working to keep CPA and CGMA designations relevant 
in this rapidly changing world, right? With big data, AI, technological adva- advancements, how are you making sure you know what you're teaching and the, the designation is relevant for today's t- world and for tomorrow's normal, as we yeah. talked about? Yeah. So, uh, so it's interesting. There's two pieces to that. On the CPA side, we just finished what we call the CPA Evolution Project. And we're actually changing up the CPA exam for the first time in a, a bit. But that new pathway forward will allow um, a couple of, of deeper dives, more a lot more technology, and a lot less the esoteric, really challenging issues that we had on the old CPA exam. So we had, I don't know, if maybe pension accounting was a big thing. So pension accounting... How many people really need to know that? And it's probably one of the hardest things there is to learn, right? So, um, so those kind of things, we started to like pull some of that down and increase things like data, good financial reporting, like in the corporate side. Mm-hmm. And then how, obviously the audit, getting more uh, technology oriented around how we audit. So we baked in a lot more technology, clearly uh, a lot more of the changing standards around all that. And that's the new exam, which starts in January, 2024, where you will be able to take what was the BEC, a business environment and concepts, and you'll be able to pick a specialty under that one of three. And that will be a little bit of a deeper dive. So it could be in financial reporting. It could be in auditing. Um, I think uh, info systems is the third one. And that would give you that ability to do that. So that's, that's one big way. I'll let you mm-hmm. ask questions there or anything around that. I, I think that's great. You're doing that. I saw something similar, you know, CFA just made some changes to theirs as well, where they added a practical session where you can do like, I think it's data science or modeling or something to take that little bit of that deeper dive. So I think that is definitely something we're seeing with some of these different certifications and that's exciting to see. It'll be out, you said, next year? Is that when that comes? Yeah, it'll be January of uh, 23 will be the first, um, no, January 24 will be the first edition of that exam. So uh, and there's, a, there's a whole you know transitional period for people that are already partway through the old exam, if you will. Sure. But that's what we'll be seeing from that standpoint. Now, um, the, other, the other part of that on the CGMA side, that curriculum we own, that's a credential that we created over in the UK. It's qualified it. around the world. And so that we update every two years now. So that already has a whole lot, including like some ESG concepts, obviously a lot more of the technology piece. So that's getting continually updated with all those exact kind of current notions. So it's in the it's in the update phase now and will be released, I think, early next year with a new edition of that. So that's where that goes. Got it. So on the CGMA, you completely own that accreditation and OCPA. You're dealing with state boards and correct. probably a very complex regulatory environment, I would imagine. It, it is, which, which is where the whole uh, debate around the 150-hour issue is coming around. Many don't realize that that is actually in the state law. So it isn't something we actually control. We can influence it. If we work with the state societies, we can you know, appeal to the, to the legislator folks. But even the state boards of accountancy don't own that exam or NASBA. It's actually in the state law. And that state law would have to be changed as you do that. So right now, we are the most reciprocal and mobile profession in the United States. Lawyers, doctors, engineers, none of them have the level of mobility meaning I could take my CPA license in Maryland and I can go to D.C., Virginia, Pennsylvania without any relicensing, very minimal stuff to get practice in those environments. And uh, that's different than almost all. Nurses are the only close second. And I think they're just about above 40 now. And that's through this idea of a compact. But we're definitely the model there. And so we're trying to preserve that. And uh, and that's what we work with the state CPA societies and all the boards and, you know, that that, that complex landscape that you just referred yeah, to. Yeah, and I've definitely heard, I know the 150-hour rule, I know there's a lot of opinions, and I've definitely heard people talking about that and you know, the frustration, having not done the accounting degree, but knowing enough CPAs, working with plenty in my career, I, I know that's a hot-button issue. We'll put it that way. <laughs> yeah, it's, I mean, it got decided at our AICPA council meeting uh, 
in, in just a couple of weeks ago uh, in May. And then it is, uh, so we're going to go with a plan that we have right now called a 12 point plan. And that will ho hopefully make an, a dent in this pipeline. And then uh, most will say, let's, let's hold off on that unless we find a creative way to move to the 120 without calling, causing all that disruption. Got it. Um, that makes sense. So I have one more tech question here. Then we're going to move a little bit into FP&A and how they work with accounting. Yeah. So, you know, we've talked a little bit about it, but just want to kind of ask you a little more direct. How do you see this new technology, chat GPT, BARD, you know, other generative AI products changing the accounting profession? Yeah, I mean, it's already having an impact. Uh, one of our, so in, in our future finance group, we just met a couple of days ago in, uh, our headquarters in Raleigh Durham, and uh, and all those global executives, finance executives, were saying it's changing the game. A couple of them were software executives and software companies, CFOs, and they said already their board and everybody is is mandating they work on AI as part of their new strategy. So it's influencing even the biggest tech companies immediately, which mm -hmm. tells me it's going to have a huge impact all the way through our profession. But here's how I'm thinking about it right now for, for what I would say CPAs or finance and accounting professionals, CGMAs, et cetera, FB&A folks right now. There's a, there's a concept of the fourth industrial revolution. And um, a futurist named Nancy Giordano wrote a book um, called Leadering, how, okay. um, right, how visionary leaders play bigger. And I did a LinkedIn Live with her, and she was um, – I thought very insightful. She talked about the fourth industrial revolution and how it's, you know, the exponential technologies are causing dramatic increases in change. And um, that was way before chat GPT. And she also made the point that we were only 1% into this new era of AI, machine learning, all these, you know, 4G, 5G, 6G. All, so taking <laughs> bandwidth, processing power and storage, exponentially increasing. And now it's combining in these technologies like chat GPT and, and large language models, et cetera. Now, so now what she said about it, I thought she goes, I'm renaming the fourth industrial revolution to the first productivity revolution. Interest. I like and, that term. And if, right, I, I know you're, you're I, I see the look on your face. You get it, right? Because what everyone's doing right now with chat GPT is its productivity for professionals. Mm -hmm. it's, it's incredible. And I think that's where I think accounting and finance professionals need to start. You have to at least understand it before it starts working its way into every software tool you have. Right? Microsoft's building it into everything as of now. I mean, there's pilots actively going on. It's in Teams. It's, yep. in, it's in Microsoft. It's in Excel. It's in uh, PowerPoint. It's in Outlook. It's in all those pieces. Right. And so that's that's, I think, significant. Now, the other part I think is significant is instead of just focusing on the you know, shiny thing called chat GPT, we need to focus on the trends that are driving that because the trends are what could disrupt us in our profession more so than just just uh, the AI stuff. Now, I, I call this the age of the chat GPT accelerator because. COVID accelerated everything by five years, according to one of our futures we work with, Dan Burris. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I think everyone would say that's true, right? Can you even remember the years back anymore? You get them all confused, right? Was it 21 or 20? You know, it's like, it's so, like after COVID, before COVID. Correct. You, know, easy. you can't put the year right. on it anymore, right? It's just, it's, I can't remember when that actually started or ended. So I think we're in the next phase of that, which is another at least five-year acceleration from ChatGPT. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and so our future finance group, again, about 30, 40 leaders yesterday, last, yeah, yesterday, I asked them, what do you guys think? Is this an accelerator and what to what degree? And they said, oh, yeah, it's, it's on our minds. We're all getting asked questions about it. It's, it's big. Um, so and then I heard one. One of our um, CFOs, large software company, has an early edition release of the Microsoft Copilot, and she said we had a we had a meeting on Teams, we, we uh, did a transcription, so it's now it's powered by ChatGPT. It transcribed the meeting, then it broke it down into the five actions that were coming out of that meeting, 
scheduled calendar invites for the people that said they were going to do it. And literally, it was like a, it was a project manager level stuff. Mm-hmm. And that was instant, right? Instant. Another, another guy said, I was, I was starting an email. I was trying to find a document that somebody wanted. And, the, and then the Outlook went and said, wrote the email and said, here's where the document is, attached it. Is this the right one? And then literally, it was ready to go then. He said he would have spent probably 30 minutes poking around the, his, his intranet to try to figure out where the heck that file was, right? I, I can relate to that. Yeah, I, I've been there where I'm searching for a file and can't find it. Yes, yes. And they say professionals lose like some ridiculous amount of productivity looking for things they know they have, but they can't find where they are. Guilty, right? Guilty as charged. So so how do we, yeah. And, and so I think that's where we start. Now, the other part, I, I did a poll on LinkedIn for um, for finance professionals. And I said, where are you with uh, ChatGPT? Have you started? Uh, are you thinking about looking at it? Are you already using it you know, for a couple of months, et cetera? And um, I think it was like 66% said not touching it. Now that's only a couple of months old, but that went to like, I think it was like 36,000 people responded to that poll. So when I looked at that, I'm like, I said, you know what? This reminds me of the early days of the internet when everybody was like afraid to do anything. And so finance folks, I think they look at this like a rattlesnake. They like to look at it, but they don't want to touch it. Mm-hmm. So the answer is right now, we're going to have to touch the rattlesnake. We have to learn, pick it up, learn how to pick it up safely, look at it, figure out how do we deal with this thing. A hundred percent agree. And a couple of things I've even done is I recently did some some training. Uh, I have a course I'm getting ready to release, uh, Smart Driving uh, Value Through Smart Analysis. And I the, the longest video in it is about 15 minutes. And it's three examples of how to use ChatGPT to help with some analysis showing both that it gets some things wrong, but also can be help you be more productive. And, you know, I do some Excel training and sometimes I'll do the same type of thing with Excel. I'm like, learn how to use it to help you. You got to be smart enough to validate what it's returning is correct, but it can save you a ton of time. And I've seen so many amazing examples. I was at a conference last weekend in California and we had, you know, four demos from finance software of how they're using FP&A. We had uh, you know, a polymath that's developed, uh, he's helped involved in the first artificial kidney that's AI driven to help with, not kidney, it was pancreas, pancreas, wow. to help with insulin. He was wow. talking about how he helped build that. And so you know, just the things we're seeing is amazing. And I'm like you, anyone who's not at least learning about it and trying it is doing themselves a disservice for their career because I've seen, they showed a demo of Copilot. And the things that we'll be able to do, if you're not using it, you're going to be way behind in productivity. You're yeah. going to be working later, or you may be out of a job because, well, so-and-so is doing three times as much work as you. Correct. Why is that? Exactly. Yeah, I think you're spot on there, Paul. And I think that's why our our uh, our tribe, if you will, FP&A, finance and accounting, all, all of us have to embrace it a bit safely. Now, don't go popping all your company data into the open <laughs> chat GPT uh, initiative or BARD, but you have to, if you can get the private instance or your company does, then you can do it, but certainly use it at least for the productivity pieces that aren't confidential so that you can get a feel for how this, not only how it works, but how fast it works. It's incredible, right? If you typed in stuff and watched it just spit out good stuff, like summarize this, 25 page PDF and you get instantly here are the five things you need to see in this document. That's, that's incredible. And, and then there's people like my 10 year old daughter that spend wants to spend all day on it, asking it to write bloopers about Paw Patrol and Sonic <laughs> and other stuff. And it's funny. She's used both Bard and GPT. And the other day I asked her, I go, so Hannah, which do you prefer, you know, Bard or chat GPT? And she goes, I prefer J- chat GPT. And then she was worried how Bard would feel. And so she goes, but I'm glad Bard's not self-aware. I'm glad it's artificial intelligence, not real intelligence. So that's probably been my favorite thing so far on ChatGPT and Bard. That's, I might have to tweet that with attribution to your daughter. That's pretty cool. <laughs> and feel free to use it. it. It was very cute. I wrote it down. I'm like, I got to remember that one. It's not self-aware. That's a classic. <laughs> So, you know, so moving on, talking a little bit about FP&A, we've covered a lot on you know, the accounting, but just from your pers- perspective, 
Now, what do you see the key differences between the accounting role and the FP&A role? So I, I think the worlds are colliding. I think they're blending a lot. I think they need each other, quite frankly. And that's mm-hmm. what I'm seeing when I talk to these large corporate structures. I mean, the difference with FP&A is you guys, as far as I know, are to- and gals are totally focused on the future, trying to project and forecast and tell the business, here's what's coming. Whereas we know the accounting folks, the, obviously the controllers, they're worried about today. Although mm-hmm. even they are beginning to look at the integrity of the data in, in like how it feeds the forecast. Yep. So that's critical as we work more together in this area. Obviously the CFO office or treasury doing cash flow projections and all that. And that's where they all, um, over, if you did a Venn diagram, right? They're all intersecting. And what's happening is they're probably intersecting faster and more now that we're closing books faster we're getting the core data right and then being able to use it in that way so i think it gets to having really good business partner relationships with fpna controller right finance folks and Mm -hmm. and even into the statutory reporting etc so that you've got all these pieces working well together and there are sometimes fpna folks who've been moving into the controller and, and some of those roles and vice versa, finance folks from those roles coming into yep. fp and I mean, it really is a bit of a blurring of the, of the lines of distinction there. I agree. And I really like how you said, having to work together. I still remember one role I had. I was in the control, talking to controllership pretty regularly because we had a number of sticky accounting issues, things we were trying to clean up. We had some markets that really hadn't had fp support and corporate hadn't really been watching globally because they were very small. And now we were trying to standardize them. And so, you know, accounting wasn't always being done right. There were things that should have been done differently. And I still remember the one time I, I spent a lot of hours with controllers. And one day he goes, why do you always come to us with difficult questions? Well, if they're easy, I wouldn't be coming to you. <laughs> you know, but we, we worked through a number of issues. And I was so grateful I had them as a resource especially going back to the business because say, look, yeah. I've asked, I could have told you from up front, you probably couldn't do that, but I'll ask the question of the controller, say, look, from the official rules, we can't, we can't go yeah. there. Yeah. Or here's what we can do. And yeah. having those discussions, what are our options? Because there's obviously times where there's flexibility in how you treat things. And understanding yeah. that is, it was invaluable to have that controller. So I'm, I'm completely with you that There's a blurring. There's definitely a partnership that needs to happen. And so speaking of that, how do you think accountants and, you know, FP&A, how do we work better together? What can we do to make sure we're kind of on that same page and all working to help move the company forward? Well, I mean, it gets down to communication and shared understanding, right? That's critical. Uh, I think it gets to collaboration. How can we collaborate together to get a better ultimate product? But, But the big buzzword in the corporate finance world is the idea of a finance business partner. Mm-hmm. And they're moving uh, controller functions often into the business units, probably alongside FB&A yep. people. Mm-hmm. And that's where they have to really partner together because sometimes I think FB&A folks might know a little bit more about forecasting and projection type stuff. And the controller or the um, CFO types will know more about the data coming out of the finance system and where you can take it and move it. What's right? What's right to start with or what might be wrong, and they can identify problems if they should they exist. Completely agree. That makes makes sense to me. That yes, they're going to understand the the financials better. They're going to understand where the issues might be, the accounting, the data, and you really need to rely on them because I know I've tried to forecast with bad data. It's not fun. Yeah. Yeah. Nobody wants to try to figure out the future. I'm sure you dealt with this as a CFO. Where you're trying, okay, how do I make a projection with this? I don't even know if it's right, like right. you mentioned earlier. Exactly. You know, a, a question I get asked a lot, I'd say particularly by people working internationally, but sometimes in the U.S., but I get asked regularly, probably almost at least weekly, on LinkedIn by accountants, how to make the transition from accounting to fp yeah. A lot of them want to go and, you know, they want to be a little bit more business-facing. Yeah. And that's where they, they often see that opportunity any advice you would offer to people working in accounting that want to make that transition, things you've seen that works or thoughts? Well, I think, um, so if they come from a pure accounting background or even a CPA background and they haven't been in corporate or in the business world, 
per se. They've been in like a public accounting. Then they need a, a lot more skills, right, to get mm-hmm. to move up. They probably have skills at a basic controller plus level right now. But to go to that CFO, you've got to need a lot of strategic forth- foresight and strategic thinking. You're going to have to understand like projection techniques and those kind of things. And so I think the notion is you have to start learning the new techniques um, about what the business is going to need in a more complex environment. And by the way, in our CGMA model, at the strategic level, which a CPA could go right to, but FP&A folks could get to that and take that with whatever the prerequisites are, Mm -hmm. they would get to all these things like supply chain forecasting, understanding um, complex capital structures. How about business models, emerging business models, all those things, because everything's in flux right now. It's it's very complex environment, but we need folks that can understand with a finance background to be able to say what's going on and what can I forecast about. So so I would say you have to learn a lot about business models, a lot about strategy, a lot about forecasting software and techniques. Mm -hmm. Um, Cash flow is king right now. So you're going to need to make sure like, you know, you can't just do the indirect cash flow statement in this environment. You need a real cash flow is forecasting all the key attributes of the balance sheet and income statement. So those those would be where I would say you have to start. Um, at the AICPA and CGMA, we've got lots and lots of training resources to help build that out. Um, so I would say we've got some of that stuff, but that's where I would say you have to do. What do you think about that? I, I tend to agree. I tell people, you know, mo- most of the time the people I get, they're trying to figure out how to get a job and make the switch. And I say, one of the things first is, is are you sure it's what you want to do or is it just because it looks attractive or it would be a promotion in that, you know, if you really enjoy process and you really enjoy everything being precise and knowing what the numbers are, then it may not be right. First, you got to have that passion for the business. It's really about, you got to be willing to learn and be able to be forward thinking. One of the biggest things I say, is you got, to, like you said, strategy, understanding the business. There's those technical and the other skills you talked about. And I give the example, I work with the guy that, great accountant, really liked him. And I was looking to hire an analyst and I asked him, Hey, would you be interested in this role? He's like, Oh no, no, I did that for 10 months. You guys, it's all fuzzy math is the way you put it. Like, I like to know that the answer is right. He's like, you can go find somebody else. And I just kind of chuckled, you know? (laughs) And so that's kind of the first thing I I try to tell people is, is is it right for your personality? Why are you doing it? Because I think sometimes people think, well, I can get the promotion and oh yeah, they have that seat at the table because fp is often talking to the CFO or sometimes the CEO and supporting senior leaders. So first is understand your personality and then make sure you get the skills to be successful in the role. I like that. I like that a lot. I think you're right. And, and, and your the personality piece, um, which ties to your, you know, what kind of those in, internal, in, internal personal skills you have uh, makes an impact there, right? Because you're going to have to be a good communication and storyteller, which which is also in the CFO remit as well. Mm-hmm. So again, lots of combinations, but I think the best answer is to figure out how they can work really well together because then you've got one plus one equals three. 100% agree. Anytime you have a team working together all in the same direction, you get more done, you're more productive, everybody wins. You know, a few months ago we had a, I did a LinkedIn live. We had a lot of people attend, you know, we kind of for fun called it accounting versus FP&A and talked about at first how there's conflicts. Because yeah. almost everybody we had on the call had worked pretty much in both. And so they'd experienced both sides of the fence and talked about some of the challenges. And then we really spent the last time for, focusing on how if you work better together, you accomplish more. Yeah. Like absolutely. even, and you need to understand why, like FP&A isn't mad at you personally because they don't have their numbers and it's work day six. It's that they have the CEO or the CFO breathing down their back because it was expected yesterday. Yeah. And so when you lay out those clear expectations and everybody understands why it builds a lot more empathy and understanding, even if you can't change what's going on. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. This question here, this is kind of a new one we've added that we uh, just started here for this year's season. And so this one I want to ask is, if you could talk to one person in the world, dead or alive, who would it be and why? I think it would be um, Sir Isaac Newton. I like that one. Why? 
because he has a he has a, a a favorite quote of mine that I somewhat live by that says, "If I can see farther than people, it's because I stand on the shoulders of giants." And what he's saying there, which I think is the future to our post AI existence, is as a profession, I think the human skills are going to matter more than ever, mm-hmm. and it is going to be. Who do we connect to? How do we collaborate well and work together, thus standing on the shoulders of giants? I like I talk about our future finance group and I'm like, you are the giants I'm standing on right now because you're giving us all this insight that we can then collectively share for the better of our entire profession. So that's where I would go with that. I, I love that answer. And I really I didn't realize that quote was from him. I've heard that quote. I didn't remember that it was from him. I think it's a great quote. And I love the way you put that around AI and the future of finance and kind of bringing it back to what we've been talking about. So now we have a couple kind of more personal questions. This is one more personal we like to ask. We like to ask everybody something unique about themselves, something, you know, the audience wouldn't know. They're typically not going to find online. So something unique about yourself. So there's, I think, two unique pieces that are, are worth sharing. One is the reason I went into accounting my father being a Baltimore City cop was the fact I wanted to be in law enforcement and was going to go for the FBI because the easiest way was accounting degree. It was either accounting mm-hmm. or law. I certainly couldn't afford a basic accounting degree, <laughs> so I certainly wasn't going to afford a law degree. So thus I entered this strange world of accounting that led to a really fun career. Second is uh, on weekends, I'm a farmhand because my wife uh, is runs a school farm in, in Baltimore County, McDonough School, and she uh, early childhood, but she teaches K through 12, literally farm to fork because these kids plant the seeds, harvest them, and learn how to cook with them. And uh, and then ultimately, a lot of that stuff goes to the Maryland Food Bank. So that's a fun hobby. So you'll see me on the farm running around with the chickens and trying to plant things and such like that. Great. It sounds like a a worthwhile, both from a service standpoint and just from being out and having fun. I loved your example of why you did the accounting because one of my best friends, that's what he did. He was going accounting because he wanted to go FBI and then he got married and his wife's like, I don't know that I could have you being an FBI agent. And all of a sudden he's like, I'm just finishing my degree. Let me just get my last classes and start working. And he never did (laughs) FBI. Has had a very successful career and they're great together, but yeah, everything kind of changed. Yeah. So I'm sure you're not alone in that is yes. People want to go to the FBI. It's one of the easier are easiest routes to go. So I'm sure you're not the first or the last to go that route. Yeah. And in my case, my eyesight wasn't good enough. So you had to have 2020 uncorrected at that time. Got it. Contacts, but I didn't have uncorrected. So they were like, you don't, you just can't do this. Yeah. I'm sure it was hard at the time, but it sounds like it's worked out well. I was very glad for that now in (laughs) retrospect. (laughs) I could believe it. So this is a question we like to ask everybody. Our sponsor data rails is, you know, a planning platform that's built around Excel. So their idea is, you know, bring Excel with you and let us provide the database benefits of our tool. So what is your favorite thing about Excel? Formula, function, feature, what do you like best? I would say the, the capability of the formulas, and the one I use a lot is, the, is the, like the data sort, because I do a lot of polling and I have to sort those results quickly and get them so I can use them. Um, Pretty basic stuff, by the way, sure. as compared to what's capable. But I will say we've been predicting the end of Excel now for about a decade. <laughs> and, and I do not see that end in sight when I talk to finance and accounting pros. Yeah, I, <laughs> I, I'm with you. I say even if Excel goes away, let's just say it does, the spreadsheet is not going away. Correct. That form function is just so incredibly valuable. I don't see an end to Excel anytime soon. But I don't, I don't know that I ever really see an end to that, that spreadsheet type function because you can just, even if you're just prototyping, yeah. you may not be using it for any of the, you know, the final stuff, but just to test things. It's just so agile and flexible. It's incredible. So if someone was starting a career today and they wanted to work in FP&A, you know, particularly they really want to be in the budgeting and forecasting, the analytics side, any advice you'd offer them? I think that they, if you want to learn a business and help guide it into the future, that's what a career in FP&A will allow you to be part of. Uh, And so that's where I would look at it. Obviously, it's about understanding the business really deep and understanding new tools and technologies that can help you do that analysis and project what that business will look like into the future 
various scenarios, et cetera. So that's what I would say from that perspective. Got it. I think that's a great answer. Appreciate that. And then last question, if someone wants to get a hold of you or you know, reach out to you, what's the best way to do that? So two places, LinkedIn, uh, go to my LinkedIn profile, Tom Hood. Uh, you'll see it out there. I think I'm, I'll, I'll come right to the top of that search now that I've got mm-hmm. that status. Uh, Twitter, it's at Tom Hood, one word. And uh, an email, it's tom.hood at aicpa-sema.com. And uh, yeah, send me a, a connection request and I'll connect to you and we'll go from there. Right. I appreciate that. And we'll make sure to put those in the show notes. And, you know, if there's any other resources or things you want us to mention, you know, feel free to send those over and we'll add them to the show notes. But thank you again. I really appreciate you carving out some time for us. I know you're extremely busy, but enjoyed chatting with you today. So thank you. It's great being here with you, Paul. Thank you. And to, uh, to all the listeners out there, thank you for listening.